believe I almost talked myself out of becoming a director because I was worried about what other people would think. Welcome to the Game of Her Own podcast, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. After 15 years of working for three major league teams, including the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Chicago Cubs, I discovered the one thing I loved the most was helping women in sports shatter glass ceilings and take their seat at the table. I loved it so much that I made a business out of it. I have the honor of coaching high performing women in the sports and entertainment industry and supporting them as they go after exactly what they want in their career. So if you are feeling tired of waiting on the sidelines, done being overlooked for promotions, and you're ready to pull ahead of the pack and take your career to the next level, girl, I'm here for it. I also created the Game of Her Own podcast to support you as well. We are here to share the stories of incredible women who work in sports and entertainment. These leaders and trailblazers will inspire you with their success and the lessons they've learned along the way to the top. Ladies, there is nothing like women empowering women. I am so honored you're here. Would you believe that an EVP and assistant general manager was shy when they first started their career in baseball. You know, sometimes we see these powerful titles and we forget the person behind that title is human. Raquel Ferrer is the executive vice president and assistant general manager for the Boston Red Sox. To put things in perspective, she is just the fourth female to hold the title of assistant general manager in a baseball operations department in Major League Baseball, joining Kim Ang, Gene Afterman, and Elaine Weddington Stewart. You don't wanna miss our conversation. Raquel takes us through her journey from administrative assistant when she was super shy and how she pushed through that, grew professionally and personally into the person she is today. We talk about what it's like to work for the same company for 23 years and her approach to advocating for herself. The pivotal moment in her career when she learned how to use her voice. Her experience working in a male dominated space some of the fears that she had about going on maternity leave and the importance of knowing how you want the world to see you and standing by that every single day. All right, friends, let's do this. All right, Raquel, welcome to the game of her own. I am so excited that you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited too. I mean, I have so many questions for you. I can't wait to dive in. I say that about everybody, but it's true. I'm like so excited <laughs> to dive in and learn everything about your journey. But take us back in time and tell us when you first fell in love with sports. I don't even know what age I was, but I do know that I was the youngest of four growing up in my family. And I was extremely close to my brother, who is 14 months older than me. I'm the youngest in the family. And he's the only boy. And so I would rather hang out with him then hang out with my two older sisters who were playing with Barbie dolls and whatnot. And I just never got into that make-believe play. And I just always loved hanging out with him and his love was baseball. And so I started following every little league game he played in, went to all of his games, was his biggest cheerleader. Fast forward to high school, I told him I was going to become the manager of the baseball team, which... Uh, did not go over very well in his eyes. And I said, well, <laughs> the, I said, it's the JV team. And he said, you don't know how to score a game. And I said, well, you can teach me. And so one weekend he got me a scorebook and we spent scoring a Red Sox. I think it was a Red Sox Yankees game. And he was like berating me over my shoulder. Like, no, that's not how you score it. And this and that, like, if you're going to be the manager of the team, you have to do this right. And so he taught me because I lied and said I knew how to score a game. And he taught me that weekend. And then that following Monday, I went with the JV team and became their manager of the team. Okay. So wait, so let's, let's talk about this one. I love that your brother told you, like, you don't know what you're doing. And you said, well, you can teach me. Yes. And two, that, you know, no one condones lying, lying, but this lie was fine. You said that you, you knew how to do it and you were going. So no matter what you were going on, whatever Monday, <laughs> you had yeah. to show up for work basically. So you needed someone to teach you. So you focused on at a young age, your potential versus like the skills like that you had, like, you were like, I know I can do this. Someone just needs to tell me how. The coach of the JV team said, well, do you, because they were looking for a manager and my brother played on varsity. And so they were like, oh, Raquel Ferrari, your brother plays. And they said, oh, you know, do you know how to score a game? And I go, yeah. And then I was like, oh, shit. And then I went home that weekend because I'm like, 
I know how to score a game. You didn't ask me if I knew how to score it officially. <laughs> and so <laughs> therefore I found a little loophole until I learned how to score and then went with the team. And then, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my brother was just like, do not embarrass me. And he's like, and if you screw up the lineup, if you put like the lineup out of order, like you're done. So I kept having it in my head, like, don't screw up the lineup. Don't like make sure somebody doesn't bat out of order. Like it was all in my head because I did not, I didn't care about the team. I didn't want to disappoint my brother. Oh, I love that. So wait, how'd you do? Uh, I did great. I think I made like one mistake here and there, but it was JV baseball. So I did great. It was great. Nice. All right. So your brother was proud. Yes, he was. He never said it, but he was, he was very proud. Oh, all right. Tell me this. When did you realize you were like wanted to work in sports? So I realized in college because I still kept up this love of sports and the NBA was actually my first love. Like I fell in love back in the heyday of watching like Michael Jordan and the Bulls play and the Lakers and the Celtics and those rivalries that when the NBA was just at its peak and I fell in love with the NBA and fell in love still with baseball And when I was at URI, I went to the University of Rhode Island, I knew that I wanted to work in sports, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do, how to get into sports. Back then, there weren't really many internships in sports, nor did I know about them. And so I ended up getting to the Red Sox only because I had an older sister who met, and this is all about like where you make connections with with certain people. I had an older sister who was going to grad school, but part-time was working at the Hard Rock Cafe in Boston. Okay. Met a sports director of a radio station there that used to come in there for events. She introduced me to him. She said, hey, my little sister is trying to get into sports, whatever. From there, he introduced me to somebody who was leaving the Red Sox. And I never even met this girl. She was leaving the Red Sox to move to Georgia. And he was just like, I think you'd be great in this job. But I said, well, it's an administrative assistant. I went to school for four years. I have a bachelor's degree. This isn't what I want to do. And my oldest sister said, are you crazy? If you get this opportunity, you take whatever opportunity you can in the field that you want. And like our parents taught us, like hard work pays off, right? And so if you work hard, somebody is going to notice and eventually reward you. And that's the way that we grew up. Like my parents were immigrants, came to this country from the Cape Verde Islands and built a life from nothing. And they always taught us, you work hard and eventually you will be rewarded. So I ended up even just getting an interview, which at that time, the Red Sox were owned by the previous ownership group of John Harrington and company. And I ended up getting an interview against, I think, six other women at the time. And I ended up getting the job. That's how it started as administrative assistant. Yeah. Wow. And it was because my older sister introduced me to somebody she met at an event and it's like, it's these connections that build and that, believe it or not, I was very shy, still am to some point. Like, I do not like bothering people. I don't like going up to people saying, hey, can you introduce me to this person, to that person, whatever. I, ju- I never want to feel like I am bothering anybody. And so it was really hard for me, even at that time, to do that, to go to certain events with this person. And he would say, well, let me introduce you to somebody. And I'd be like, no, 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 wait, they're talking to somebody, you know? I was always very shy and never wanted to act like I was bothering anybody. Okay. Tell everybody what you do now and who you do it for. And then we're going to go back to that shy thing. <laughs> I don't even know what I do. Still. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you start with your title. <laughs> right. Well, right now I am executive vice president, assistant general manager for the Boston Red Sox. And so both Eddie Romero and I share that title before Zach Scott did, but he is now the acting GM of the New York Mets. So day-to-day basis is we both report to Hein Bloom and it's overseeing of the baseball operations on a day-to-day basis. My focus is on, I still oversee the Red Sox baseball operations budget. I oversee the clubhouse operations and still oversee travel amongst having my toes in a bunch of other things too. Yeah. I mean, you've been there for 23 years. So I can't, are you getting feedback? I still tell people I started when I was 12. (laughs) So how do you, okay, 23 years there, incredible like journey from where you started (laughs) to where you are now. And what was your job when you first started administrative assistant? Administrative assistant in minor leagues and scouting. And I will tell you this, I do not recommend lying on your resume. Okay. Do not recommend lying on your resume. 
But on my resume, I said I knew how to use Microsoft Word and Excel. I did not know how to use Excel. And I remember my first week on the job, our scouting director had asked me to put together some salaries for something. And I'm like, I don't know how to make this add up. And luckily, I had somebody next to me that worked with me that was just like, I think thought it was like first week, first month nerves and helped me through it. And I immediately went online and like learned how to do Excel. So I still don't recommend lying on your resume, but um, yeah. To put a twist on it, like you could put that on your resume and then go take a course while your resume is like, you know, waiting Correct. to be viewed. Which I meant to do, <laughs> but they made it, they made a decision very quickly and said, Raquel, can you start next week? And I said, oh, okay. And then I was like, oh my God, shit. I need to know how to use it. Well. Uh, Which is so dumb. Cause now every, I mean, my daughter's 13. She knows how to use Excel, but back then. I, I started with the Red Sox in 1999. So that was a very long time ago. How did you do it when you were so shy and didn't yeah. want to bother people? And like, how did you get through that? I pushed through. So when people meet me, they don't think I'm shy because I come from a very loud family. You know, you have to vocalize all the time or else you don't think anybody's going to, to hear you. Like my husband always says, you are so loud. And I'm like, that's how we had to be in my house, right? You had to speak up. You had to speak up at family events. You had to like, you know, be loud. But I also had this shy side to me that I always felt like I never wanted to bother anybody. I remember being petrified to ask to leave work early one day to go to a dentist appointment, which for somebody is no big deal. But I was like, being like, I was like, okay, okay. I have to go ask my boss. If it's okay if I leave at like four to go to like a dentist appointment. And I would get so nervous and worked up to do that. Looking back, I'm like, I don't know why I was like that because I'm certainly not like that now, but it's all a part of your growth, I guess. Yeah. I mean, push, I mean, you got to push through, right? I remember being super nervous and like sweating. I probably ruined whatever I was wearing when I went through the ambassador um, interview process at, with the Red Sox, like that whole interview process was so nerve wracking, but like you have to, you, it's just one of those things. I don't know about you, but I said to myself, either go home, right? Cause yeah. wait, this is when the 406 club, right? For those who don't know, it's oh, a, it was 406 a, a, club. Four, <laughs> a former uh, event space or, you know, area um, at Fenway park. But I remember being in there with a thousand other people and just being like, either you go home or you push through it. It's like, you want this job. You're just going to have to work through your nerves. And honestly, I don't know about you. When I finally opened my mouth. No, when I was then I was, it was shaky. It was still a little shaky, but you just, you just push through it and you keep doing it until you get to a place like you are now. And I, and I am now is that the nerves aren't as bad anymore. You know how to manage it. Yeah. I don't want to say I stopped caring, but I think I found my voice my first spring training because I realized people mistake kindness for weakness, right? And so sometimes when you don't speak up and and say something, this was going to be my first spring training. I knew that I had a lot to prove to players and staff and something kicked in that, I I don't want to say the shyness went away, but I just got a little more confident in what I believed in and what I had to say because I knew that first impressions go a very long way in this game. And so I pushed myself out of my comfort zone so badly. Like I remember being so uncomfortable that I was like, oh my gosh, I got to say something. And I did. And after I did, I was like, that wasn't so bad. And like, the more you do it, it becomes a lot easier. So I had to push myself out of my comfort zone. And most people that know me now will be like, you were not shy. And I'm like, oh, I was. Yeah. I get the same thing. I was like, this didn't just come naturally. Like I had to work really, really hard at it. And you remember those pivotal moments when you do speak up and use your voice. Like you've been doing this a long time. And I'm sure there's a lot of things you forgot. You didn't forget when you were at spring training and decided to say something. Yeah. That spring training was a rough one for me because it was my first one. I didn't know what to expect. There weren't any women in baseball ops. There was one other woman that worked there. People were telling me all different sorts of things like, you know, hey, be careful about the players, be careful about the staff, like don't do this, don't do that. So I had all these voices trying to help me, but then you also have to sort through which voices you're going to trust and listen to, which is very difficult when you're starting off relatively young and you're pushed into this environment. And so you sort of have to figure it out very quickly who you're going to trust and listen to. Oh, how do you even begin? Like, especially in your area, like, okay, so not to 
discount the work I did <laughs> as an ambassador, but we're talking fans and players, right? Like there's two, like two yep. different things and, and players are obviously the, I hate to call them assets, but like they're the product on the field or what people come to see. How did you make the decision on who to listen to when people are giving you advice about your work that impacts the players? Well, Luckily, I had some great mentors around me, but I have this ability to read people very quickly, like get me in a room with them for five to 10 minutes. And I can tell you basically read their personality. And I don't know if I got it from growing up in a big family or whatever, but I always say that I am the best scout off the field. I can evaluate talent off the field in a heartbeat on the field. Eh, That's not my strength. And I'll admit it, like you got to embrace your strengths and identify your weaknesses, right? And so on the field, hey, whatever, I can't tell you if a guy's going to be an A1 or a C1, whatever, but off the field, I will read people in a heartbeat and usually be spot on. And I was lucky that I was able to recognize the coaches and front office staff that I worked with at the time and know who to lean on and only went to certain people, right? So you don't go ask 10 different people what they think about somebody or what they should do, because you're going to get 10 different opinions. So you have to sort of trust your gut and go to certain people and just be like, Hey, what would you do in this situation? How do you think I should handle this or whatever? Like I made a decision from when I started that, you know, people in this world label you, whether you like it or not. And I wanted to make sure my label was something that I was very proud of because that's what I learned from my parents, you know? I don't want to say you only have one chance to make a first impression, but in baseball, when you're scrutinized so much, when you look different, when you are different than the norm, you have to make sure your label is something that you're proud of. And so that's what I went into my first spring training, making sure that my label was something that I would be proud of. Yes. I love that. And so many people, I mean, it's, it's good, right? Cause everyone talks about, I think some people may call it like their brands, like what their personal brand yeah. is like, that's. That's it. Like it's knowing what you want to stand for. I feel like that might be the easy part. The hard part is standing by it and executing it. it. Right. Because like, even with players, like you're labeled as like, Hey, this guy's a good clubhouse guy. This guy's a good like teammate. This guy's a good, this people do it off the field as well. And so when you want to make sure you label something proud of, it's like, okay, I wanted to make sure of that. Now I have to stand by it. And sometimes I have to do things that are difficult that I may not want to do, but I also want to make sure that I am viewed in a way that I'm putting out there that I want to be viewed, not that others are putting out there because that's what I'm responsible for, right? I'm responsible for the way people see me. And so I wanted to make sure that people were like, you know what, Raquel's always professional. She's always dressed like she's going to work because my dad always said, dress for the job you want, not for the job you have. And so I always wanted to make sure people knew that I was professional. I stood for something like I was fighting for the players and, and doing the right things, but at the same time, doing it in a way that I made myself proud. Okay. So 23 years with the same organization. Uh, So now we understand like, you know, how you present yourself. You learned that very early on and, and making sure that your label was what you wanted people to see. How did your career go from assistant to where you are now? Like, were you asking, and I'm talking about like, are you asking for promotions? Are they coming to you or? When I first started, right. So I'm like, I don't want to be an administrative assistant. Like this isn't what I wanted to do. Although they do great work. Like we, nobody could survive without administrative assistance. Like you always need the support group, but I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. In the old regime, if John Henry and his group had not bought the Red Sox, I would not be where I am today. I will guarantee you that. So when this new ownership group came in and I gave a lot of credit and I've said before in the past to Theo Epstein because he came in with Larry Lucchino and his group and Theo came in as an assistant GM. And when I came back from spring training after they had bought the team, he sat me down and he said, we've done our homework. What do you want to do with your career? That was the first time anybody ever asked me that. Right. And so here I am looking at this guy across the desk from me who I am older than. Right. And so Theo became the youngest GM at 28 years old or whatever. And he's asking me what I want to do. And I was like, um, okay. And I go, well, what do you mean? And he's like, what do you want to do? And he goes, I want you to sit down and I want you to think about what you want to do. I want you to think about a title that you want. Nobody's ever said that to me. 
And he's just like, and we're going to reconnect in a couple of weeks. And so I said, okay. So I went home, thought about it, wrote down some stuff, wrote down what I wanted to do, and then wrote down a title that a woman I knew at the Chicago White Sox had had. Her name was Grace Zwick, and it was called Director of Minor League Administration. Now, here I am as an administrative assistant, and I have the balls to say, I want to be a director. This was him saying, write down what you would want to do. So I'm thinking in the future, this is where I want to be. So I write down the title, Director of Minor League Administration, write down like my responsibilities, what I would want to do. He becomes GM, calls me into his office and says, he said, you're going to see an org chart floating around and your name is on it. And I was like, oh, thank God, I still have a job. Like my name's on the org chart. And he said, well, on the org chart, it's going to say Raquel Ferreira, Director of Minor League Administration. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Are you, are you sure you want to do that? I questioned him because I was more worried about what other people at the Red Sox were going to think that I got promoted from an administrative assistant to a director, ignoring the fact that, did I earn it? Yes. Had I been doing that stuff? Yes. I was more worried about what people at the Red Sox were going to say. And so I kept saying, are you sure this is something you want to do? And he said, yes. And he said, what are you worried about? I said, I think people are going to be pissed. And he goes, who's going to be pissed? I go, people that sit across the hall. And I knew it wasn't going to be anybody in baseball operations because I knew they would be happy. But I was like, people that sit on the other side. And he goes, I don't care what they think. And if they have a problem, tell them to come talk to me. And I was like, okay. And I'm like, I can't believe I almost talked myself out of becoming a director because I was worried about what other people would think. True story. And then when he became GM, he made that decision, promoted me. And from then on, it was I always say I was very fortunate that I was surrounded by, even though it's men in baseball operations that never looked at me as a female in baseball, looked at me as somebody that had potential. So whether it was Theo, Ben Charrington, Mike Hazen, Brian O'Halloran, like I was very fortunate that I had, these guys had my back and, and helped me grow along the way. I can't like, that's a great story. So you almost talked yourself out of it and not because you didn't think you could do the job, but because you were worried about what other people were going to think. Yeah, I was worried about what people would say. And then I'm like, I'm an asshole. Like, why do I care? But at that time I was worried. I was just like, oh my God, are people going to be mad? Like, what are they going to say? And I was so worried about what people were going to say. Wow, so much credit to Theo to talk you through it. Yeah, he almost like kicked me out of his office. (laughs) I mean, sure, sure. A little. (laughs) He almost kicked me out like, hey, I'm giving you this title. Like, what are you doing? And I just kept saying like, what? Or, but after that, I still definitely had to ask for my promotions. Right. And so I've always been surrounded myself with people that have supported me, but I always feel like men are given their promotions on merit and women have to ask for it. Right. So after that point, from there on in, I felt like I had to ask for it. So once I became a director, I was a director for a long time. And then it turned into, okay, well, what do I have to do to become a vice president? Right. And it's, and it's sort of looked at differently at that time was looked at differently in baseball operations than on the business side, because in baseball operations, like think about it, you do not have many female vice presidents at all. You know, when you're still labeled as the third, the fourth, the something in front of you, that means there's not a lot of people, right? So I definitely still had to ask after that point, what do I need to do to become this, this, that, whatever. One thing I know for sure is it can be exhausting and emotionally draining as you go after what you want in your career. Maybe you're ready for the next level, but you're not sure how to get there. Maybe you're not sure how to use your voice to grow your career or you just don't feel seen and heard in your organization. And I don't want you to have to go at it alone. It is why I'm putting together a small group of women for the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching experience. If you are tired of things just going, okay, this group may be for you. If you're ready to use your voice to influence change, speak truth to power, build your brand, and advocate for yourself without feeling like you're bragging, this group is for you. Enrollment opens soon. So in the meantime, I invite you to join the waiting list. Be the first to hear more about the program and also when more spots open up. You probably already know this, but it's worth saying. 
there is something so powerful about women empowering women. And that's exactly what you'll get in this program. Coaching and accountability from me and the support and empowerment from other women in this group. If this sounds like the right fit for you, head to the show notes and join the waiting list for the Be Seen and Heard at Work group coaching program. All right, let's get back to the episode. All right. So after that, you had to ask, and you said you were a director for a long time. Like what's a long time? So I became a director in, when did Theo become GM? 2002, 10 years. Then I became a senior director, which (laughs) did not exist. Right? Are you the one who created the senior director? Well, I did not, I did not create it, but apparently, (laughs) but apparently vice president was not in the cards. And so it was, how we're going to make you senior director. I was the first senior director of Red Sox. <laughs> so it may, was, maybe everywhere. <laughs> it was 10 years because now there's titles created everywhere. So it was yeah. 2002 to 2012, I think. I think 10 years. And then I became a senior director. And then I became a VP at the end of 2014. But even then, I was only the third female VP in baseball operations. Jeez. Like in the history of Major League Baseball, like that's sad. Say you that have- one more time. You were the third VP. So I was, I was the third female VP in baseball operations. When I became vice president in 2000, at the end of 2014, the third female vice president in baseball operations. So there was only Jean Afterman and Kim Ang. But Elaine Weddington Stewart was the first assistant GM in all of baseball, but she was not a VP and was not in baseball operations at the time. So there's like this distinction. So that's why I became the third female vice president, but I am the fourth assistant general manager in all of baseball that's been a woman because Elaine was the first. But I will have to say the Red Sox and the Yankees, kudos to them. They're the organizations that have had two female assistant GMs. Nobody else has had one. Okay, I'm going to link to all of those women you just talked about in the show notes. So if anyone wants to read about them, they can. So did you guys, like, did you talk to them all the time and ask them questions or like? So I've talked to, I mean, I've talked to Elaine a lot since well, being at right. Red Sox. Um, but Gene Afterman and I from the Yankees are very close, extremely close. We text all the time. She sends me wine during the pandemic because she was out in California. She's my girl. Like we are you know, arch enemies on the field, but off the field, she is a huge, huge support system for me. And mm-hmm. I can run things by her. And Kim Ang has just done things that we all knew she would do or could do. I'm not as close with Kim, but, you know, I still talk to her, but Jean and I talk at least four times a week. It's nice to have that support. And I always talk about having just allies or your squad, whatever, whatever name we want to give it these yeah. days, but like, it's just, it's so important to have that connection with someone else. Do you feel this sort of, or did you, or do you feel this sort of weight on your shoulder knowing that women are, are like looking up to you? Like you're in a position and there's not very many of you who do that. Somebody asked me that question before and I, I do feel a weight, but I think I put it on myself because I never like to do media events, right? I don't like to sit on panels, but Jean Afterman is the one that talked me into doing them. And she said, Raquel, you have a daughter who is young. Who, and that's what got me. And she said, she is looking up to you, right? And so when I was younger, you have to see it to believe it, right? And so Jean is the one that talked me into doing more of these panels. She goes, even if you and I do them together, and she goes, Gabby needs to see her mom out there and her friends need to see it. Her little friends in her class, whether they're boys or, or girls, need to see women out there doing things because you need to see it to believe it. So she's the one that has encouraged me to get out there more and be in the public eye more, not for myself or self-promotion, but just to let the younger generation see that, you know what, this is something that you could do. Yes. That's so, it's so inspiring. And I remember when I started and for me, you know, it was gosh, almost 20 years ago. And so I just remember like looking around, like, Hmm, nobody looks like me here. Nobody looks like me. (laughs) Right. Like it's just a natural thing you do, right? Like you just want to, for me, I always gravitate towards people who inspire me and I want to be like, so I always gravitate towards people who are very outspoken and show up as their authentic selves unapologetically. Yeah. Like those are my, like, those are my favorite type of people. Cause I wanted to be that way. Um, and I was very shy and an introvert. So it was hard for me to do that. And the other thing is, okay, like 
women or really black women. Like, how are you doing in here? (laughs) What's happening? And there was just, there was nobody. And there was one person, two, sorry, two with the Red Sox. And, but even that, like, I always think back, I'm like, gosh, that's just a lot of pressure for someone to, to hold. It's a, it's a lot of pressure and you don't want to always put that pressure on that one person. Like my daughter always asks me, mama, how come you're the only girl all the time? How come you're this or that? How come nobody else, you know, looks like you? How come nobody looks like me that's out there? And so it, it's sort of this, I don't want to say this obligation that you have, but you feel this sense of responsibility to let people know, like, you can do this. Like, you can. There are people that look like me, that look like you, that look like my daughter, that look like Elaine, that look like Marcy, that, that look like anybody at the Red Sox that can do this and are doing it well, but you need to showcase those people because otherwise I would have never thought I could be where I am or do what I do or be even pushed out of my comfort zone if it wasn't for Jean Afterman telling me, hey, you can do this. If it wasn't for Elaine always being in my ear, being like, Raquel, you got this. Elaine is sneaky. Elaine is like the sneaky, silent whisperer to people. (laughs) (laughs) Like she has always been like, Raquel, you got this. And like Marcita, I mean, I could not have survived my time at the Red Sox without, like you always have to build relationships with not just your family or people outside your family, but people at work that are there to support you and cheer you on because you need people that are going to cheer you on at work. And I have made lifelong friends at the Red Sox of women, especially women, I think, because Sometimes women always seem to be in competition with each other in a male dominated field. And I think you need to surround yourself with women that are going to support you and be there for you and cheer for you and be your cheerleaders, because that's what's helped me along the way. Mm, Yes. And and I'll link to um, Marcita as well. Marcita Thompson. Gosh, I haven't haven't heard that name in a really long time. (laughs) It's so true. Surrounding yourselves with like women who who can help you and support you because it, your day or your week or your month should never look like you should never feel isolated. You should never be right. your only cheerleader. Yes. You have to believe in yourself and find the courage and, and push through things, but you should also have someone else, multiple people's better, like kind of whispering in your ear, just something simple as you got this or yep. you're yes, this is you. That's, that's what you should do. Like I remember Sarah McKenna and you guys heard Sarah's episode before those of you who are listening, but like, I remember I was, I said something and she was like, this is the work that you do. Like, no, you go lead that team. And I'm like, oh, like, right. Like sometimes you just need like a a reality check and someone to remind you like you're good and go do it. Like go show them who you are, right? Well, she's a big pusher of making sure the right people get out there with the voices because she's no joke, as we all know. Like she'll Mm -hmm. push people out there and be like, oh, no, this is your idea. You go do it. And Yes. And whatever. And that's that, but that's what you need. You need people that are going to be, that you know are supportive of you and that are going to cheer for you when you do well and not cheer for you when you do poorly. Yeah. It's so true. And are there when you like go do the thing and then sometimes you fail at it. Yep. And they're there to support you as well. Yep. Like I said, I have made some lifelong friends at the Red Sox. Several of them were at my wedding. They will be with me throughout like it's 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 so important to make sure you have that support group there that you have at work Mm. whether it's men or women yep yes okay tell everybody what what it was like for you just to everyone's experience is different when in working in a male-dominated space right it's I I think it's so hard to generalize sometimes for you what was it like and did you find it tougher to like sort of navigate those internal politics those unspoken rules I didn't at first, because I grew up like being so close to my brother, right? And most of my friends were guys in college. Like I had a great group of girlfriends, but I also had a great group of guy friends. But I think my mistake in the beginning is that everyone was like, Raquel's one of the guys. And I was just like, yeah, I am. Like, because nothing bothered me, nothing. But as I grew older, I'm like, do I want to be one of the guys? Because first of all, you'll never be one of the guys, right? No matter how hard you try, you will never be one of the guys. And I think it took me a while to actually understand that because you were there when we were down in the basement, we were isolated, like, 
in our baseball ops bubble and, and things like that. And I always thought I was one of the guys and it took me a while to realize I don't want to be one of the guys. I want to be the girl or one of the girls you bring other people in, but it, it wasn't difficult for me to, to navigate at first because I think people that came into the Red Sox with, you know, Theo and Ben and Brian O'Halloran and Mike Hazen, like all these guys were, I mean, I cannot tell you, they were awesome to me and still are like, they're still family. I still keep in touch with Theo, Mike Hazen, Amiel, like all of these guys, like once you leave the Red Sox, as you know, I'm sure you, you've kept in touch with a ton of the people that you were ambassadors with. Like you just don't outgrow that. I still keep in touch with, with all of them. So luckily it was not very difficult for me to navigate, but you are still fully aware that you are the only woman in the room sometimes. And when that, when you walk into a room, sometimes the conversation changes and then you have to second guess yourself Well, you're like, did it change because I just walked into the room and I'm a woman or did it change because it's something confidential people are talking about. But I think you always second guess yourself when that happens, when you walk into a room and it turns into whispers, then you're like, okay, is it because I just walked in here or is it something confidential or whatever? So your, your antennas are kind of always up because like I said, you'll, you'll still never be one of the guys as hard as you try. So I think a lot of us do that, right? Like we kind of make up that story in our head, like of, what might be happening, like insert situation here. Like it's always so easy to just have that internal dialogue and then believe it. Like, so do you ever, I always tell people just say it, like call it out. Like if you feel like the story in my, and I'm stealing this from Brene Brown, but like the story I'm telling myself is this, like, and then just have the conversation with somebody. Oh yeah. I ever call call people out. Oh yes. A lot. Yes. I love it. I am not that shy person from 1999. No, I'm, I'm not not anymore. And I will call people. I'll be like, what are you guys talking about? And then I'll say stuff or whatever. They'll be like, oh, Raquel, we would just whatever. And I'll be like, okay. Like I have no problem calling people out anymore. I am a different person than when I was, which I hope I am in 1999, just like gaining more confidence in yourself and what you do and what you believe in. And so I have no problem calling people out. Ask, ask Sam Kennedy. He'll agree with that. And for those of you who don't know, Sam Kennedy is the CEO, president now, is that yeah, right? President. He did an interview and he said, uh, Raquel says what she thinks. She's not afraid to call people out. And I was like, thanks, Sam. Is that good or bad? I was like, <laughs> I, no, mean, I, I will call people out. See, I, and I love that. And I love that story, right? Like you, you started out shy and I'm sure in 1999, Raquel could not imagine a world where she was no. calling people out and saying what she thinks, but you, you did it. And like, you just constantly pushed yourself to be going back to what your parents said, like just to be like, you work hard and then yeah. you afford it. And like, you know what you want it and you know what you had to do to work hard. And sometimes working hard is working on yourself and growing. That's what I, I had to do. And I constantly had everything that I did. I would always think about my parents and what they went through and what they did when they, you know, first came to this country and started with nothing because I've always operated on the fact that you get what you give and you give what you get right in your job. And so everybody always says, you know, Raquel, a lot of these players like talk so highly of you and, and they have great relationships with you. And I was just like, it's because you get what you give and you give what you get. Like I give a lot of love and respect to these guys. What I get back is tenfold from them. And that's a life lesson that my parents taught me. And that's, it's something that I still do every day. Like you give respect and love, you are going to get that back from people. And when you get it back from like team of people and whatever, like it just, it encourages you. It just makes you want to keep doing your job. Like those days that are hard where it sucks and you don't want to go in and this and that, you just keep thinking about those things. And it's just like, that's what sometimes gets you through the day. You know, I want to ask you this one question before we go to rapid fire questions. So rapid fire. Oh, okay. (laughs) So, you know, speaking of make like people make up stories a lot. And I think one story and one, one thing narrative I'm starting to hear from women who haven't, who are married, but, or, or not married, who cares, but like who want to have children, right. They make up that story that, well, I don't want to take this role, a higher up role because I'm going to have kids one day and I'm not going to be able to balance it all. Or I, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I want to, you know, put the effort into it because I'm going to have a kid and nobody's going to want to deal with like 
right? Like they're gonna want me to work all the time. It's sports, it's crazy. And as a coach, I have to meet them where they are and like help them get to where they wanna be. But like, what advice would you give? Like, what's your gut reaction? I'm I'm hearing those noises you're making and seeing those faces. (laughs) Because this was, this was, painful for me. Right. And so I got married later in life and I, I could not wait to have a child. And I kept putting it off because I kept saying, you know, it's, it's not the right time. And then my crazy self, is thinking, you know, I need to get pregnant and figure out when I'm going to give birth because it can't be during the season and whatever. So I had all these crazy things going through my mind, like a nut bag. And then I finally get pregnant and all of a sudden I realize I'm delivering my baby during spring training. And then like the anxiety hits. Cause then I have to tell Theo and all these guys that I'm pregnant. Luckily Theo's wife was pregnant and delivered a baby in December. I delivered my daughter Gabby in March. But when I told the guys, they were all excited, but all of a sudden they go, Oh wait, you're going to miss spring training. And I go, yeah, I am. And then they're like, will you be back for the draft? And I'm like, And all this shit goes through your mind about, am I still going to have the same job when I get back? Right. Are people going to forget about me? That's what I, I was, I was like, we're going to forget about me. Am I going to not be thought of the same? Am I going to be pushed to the side? Is somebody else going to come in and take over? And you just, it's easier said than done, but you just can't worry about it because after I had my daughter, I didn't give a shit about anything, but what I did wrong was not taking proper maternity leave like I should have. So I got home and I answered an email the day after I got home. And that was <laughs> bad because then everybody started emailing me, even though the guys I worked with were <laughs> Brian O'Hallen was like, don't email Raquel, she's on maternity leave. And they will, everyone, every single person was just, well, I just need to ask her one question. And then it was like 50 <laughs> people just asking me one question. So you can't worry about that. And then you know what? my mom would always say, it's going to work out. Don't worry about it. Because I was thinking, what am I going to do next spring training? I have to go for seven weeks. Who's going to watch Gabby? And like everything ends up working out. You end up figuring it out, but you can't keep putting it off though. Cause you're going to regret it. Like I did. Yes. Okay. So you skipped spring training and I shouldn't say skipped spring training. Cause that makes yeah. it seem like you had a choice, <laughs> but you had, you were on maternity leave during spring training. So you did not go, you did not work. You answered some emails, but like, was it, gosh, like you said, you didn't take a long maternity leave. Like, did you, how like quickly did I, you go back? If I can be nosy. I, I didn't necessarily go back in the office. I think I started going back after a couple of weeks, I would go in maybe once a week, but I was definitely answering emails and making phone calls way more than I should have. And I was still at home, but you know, they say, Hey, when the baby sleeps, you sleep. Like when she slept, I would answer emails and phone calls and I came back for the draft. So that meant I put her in daycare at 13 weeks, which I felt like was a dagger in my heart. And I felt like I was the worst mom ever for doing that. But it turned out to be the best thing for her. I think anyway, I don't know. She might want to answer that question, but <laughs> but I put her in at 13 weeks and I came back right before the draft. So it, it was hard. And and I did it three days. I think we put her in three days a week for the first year. And then my husband and I rotated staying home one day with her, but it, it was hard. I can, I mean, I can only imagine. Right. And so our parents, even if I don't know if, if your mother worked, mine did, and she was only took two weeks of maternity leave. And so when I was younger and like high school, college days, like I just thought, I was like, yeah, my mom's such a, like, that's awesome. She like took two weeks and then went back to work. Now, as I got older, I'm like, oh, did she feel like she didn't have a choice? Like she yeah. didn't want to lose her job. Was she worried about her job going yeah. to someone else? And my I parents, her. my parents flip flop shifts, right? My dad worked like third shift and then my mom worked second shift or whatever. They worked our entire lives. My mom was never a stay at home mom, which I think is the hardest job anyway, because nobody ever says stay at home dad. Like it's, it's, it's a hard job. So she always worked, but my parents rotated shifts and it was because one, they needed the money to do that. And two, you didn't want to lose your standing anywhere. You still worry about that in sports. You, you worry that you're going to be forgotten because if you're gone for an extended period, you have this fear that, well, they can operate without me. So why would they want me back? Or when I come back, are things going to be different? Cause someone's going to be doing my duties and things like that. So I think it's still an issue with, with a lot of women that choose to, you know, have babies and, 
and still work. And it should be made a lot easier for people. It's still something we need to work on. What advice would you give mothers to be, or even like just parents to be, right? Like if we're talking about maternity <laughs> leave or paternity leave, like either way, like what advice would you give people who are like, I want to do this and I want to take a long time, but I'm worried that I think you need job. to, I think you need to talk to the people that you work with, because what I did is I went and talked to Theo and those guys, but I was lucky that two of them had just had babies around the same time. And so they were like, Raquel, do you have a night nurse? Do you have a whatever? I was like, night nurse. I was like, <laughs> I'm the night nurse. Like, so I think, <laughs> it, I think it's about talking to the people that you work with and setting expectations or you laying down your expectations, what you want to do and say, listen, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm going to do. I'm available, this, 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 whatever, because it should be made easier for men and women. Like sometimes men are afraid to take paternity leave and they shouldn't be. Like they're just as important as the moms are in the beginning. I mean, they might not be breastfeeding if that's what you choose to do, but like, it's still just important for them to be as home too. And so when people are like, why are you guys taking paternity leave? And I'm like, because you're a good dad. Like you should be home with your child. (laughs) Yes. I mean, right. Yeah. Should, that shouldn't even be a question. Um, when dads want to stay home, like that, sh- it shouldn't, it doesn't need to be celebrated or like anything. It's just like, yeah, no, that's good. It should be the norm, right? It's just <laughs> right. Like, when guys are like, oh, I'm babysitting my kids tonight. I'm like, you're not babysitting them. They're your <sighs> kids. It's parent. It's called parenting. <laughs> I can't, I can't. That's right? the worst. <laughs> I'm like, do you want a cookie? Like, you're parenting. You're not babysitting your children. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> I, like, I like that advice. I like the laying down those expectations. And back yeah. to what we said before is it's hard to stick to those, right? Like setting up those boundaries, setting up those expectations, but then you have to, the hard work is sticking to them. Right. But then you have something to fall back on. Right. And so mm-hmm. if some of you are working for, is just like, well, I didn't know you were going to do this. And you have to say, no, yes, you did. This is what I laid out. And this is what I plan to do. And if it changes, fine, you adjust from there, but at least you're setting out the expectations. Yes. Yep. All right. Are you ready for 12 rapid fire questions? Oh, 12. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I promise they go really, what? they go really fast. Okay. First thing that comes to your mind. Don't even think about it. Don't overthink it. Okay. What is your favorite sports moment? I'll have to say, even though people won't believe this, I'll have to say 2007 World Series. And I feel like that's become the forgotten one, but I feel like we had more homegrown players on our team. And so that's the one that actually meant the most to me. And I was pregnant in Colorado with Gabby in my belly, but 2007, because we had the most homegrown players. Yes. I did not know you were pregnant then. Yeah. All right. Or maybe I didn't. And it's one of those things that have left my brain because I, was, I only I was, have room was, for so much. People just thought I was eating a lot, but I was, I was on the field. <laughs> like, yeah, this belly is not nachos. It's, you know, there's someone in there. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that people always get wrong about you? I always get, Raquel, people are scared of you. And I'm like, why? Mm-hmm. And I've gotten that a lot. People say that they're intimidated by me or they're scared. And anybody that talks to me knows that I'm extremely approachable, but I think because I was trying to be so serious so early on in my career that people may have misunderstood that for me being scary or intimidating. I did not find you scary. I found you like, you were like a, you were in my, my boss list that I had in my head. Like you, (laughs) like certain women, Mercita, Sarah, I was just, I mean, Sarah actually was my boss, but like, you know what I mean? I was like, oh, these women are no joke. Yeah. Oh, see, that, that's good. But then when people say, oh, you're scary though. I'm like, what? All right. Good to hear. Yeah. yeah Elaine. Like I was just like, no, I yeah. wanted to like talk. I mean, you were downstairs in the dungeon. So like I didn't, that's that area may was be scary. Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that area you was scary. You didn't go down there. There were a lot of rules no. that you got that were never written. And you were just like, you don't go down. People the only went down there like for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yes. All right. What is one food you wouldn't want to give up? Oh, does red wine count? It sure does. Pizza and red wine. <laughs> no, you wait, more- wings and red wine. Wait, what is it? Chicken wings. I love wings. Oh, yeah. Do you have an air fryer? Oh, no, but my husband is a fantastic cook. Oh, and he nice. makes the, he, yeah, chicken wings and red wine. Mm, all right, good one. Are you a morning person or a night one? Oh, night, night person. person. Night. night. Oh, okay favorite holiday used to be Thanksgiving, but 
but I'll stop there because I'm going to start playing afterwards. So Great. Thanksgiving though. Thanksgiving is still. What <laughs> job would you absolutely be horrible at? I would be a horrible teacher because after going through COVID with my daughter and seeing what teachers have to go through, I would have lost my shit by April of 2020, <laughs> of 2020, after a month of remote. I would be a horrible, like third grade teacher or something like that. I would be horrible at it. Yeah. I don't know how they, I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure a lot of people would say the same thing. What product would you stockpile if you found out they weren't going to sell it anymore? Oh, my vitamin C serum, I think, that I use on my face. Is it Drunk Elephant? No, it's called, oh my God, what's the name of it? It's in a blue bottle. It's this vitamin C serum that I put on my face every day, but I swear I'm just like, oh my gosh, I have to wear it every day. And I would probably stockpile it if I could. That's a good one. I love mine as well. Uh, what's your favorite app? I would say, I'd probably say Instagram. Who's your biggest inspiration in life? Mm, my parents. As a child, what did you wish to become when you grew up? Backup dancer for Janet Jackson. <laughs> if, somebody, if somebody said, Raquel, if you weren't working in baseball, what would you do? In my head, I wanted to be a backup dancer for Janet Jackson. <laughs> Okay, last one. Yep. Finish this sentence. The future of women working in sports is? Bright. Because it can't get any dimmer. So it's got to be bright. Yes. Yeah, we got we to gotta do better. Yep. Yes. Tell me this. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, how can they go about doing that? Probably Instagram, email. I'm horrible at LinkedIn. Horrendous. <laughs> so please don't get in touch with me at LinkedIn. Like I, I'm really, really bad with LinkedIn. I mean, you can get in touch with me on LinkedIn. I'm just, I'm not very responsive on that. I'm going to be honest. And that's really I think bad. I probably should do that. That's okay. That's, that's all right. You got to pick one or two and then that's it. Yeah. Okay. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to all of us oh, and sharing thanks. your journey. Thanks. So what did you think of this episode? Do you know another woman who works or is aspiring to work in sports? Would you do me a favor and share this with them? It would mean so much if together we could support and inspire other women on their journey. And let's stay connected. I love meeting and talking to new people. Follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake and join the free game of her own community by visiting jahanblake.com. I can't wait to meet you.